my name is Matt Gardner. I'm a senior fellow at the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. And uh, for the past 20 years, I've been working on issues of individual and corporate taxation, trying to figure out when our tax system is working well, when it can be made to work better, and, and, and what policy changes could, could, uh, could get us there. Apple came on a lot of people's radar right around 2010. And what made it happen, at that point they were already kind of profitable. Up to that point, they'd been reporting most of their income in the U.S. And in, starting in 2010, a funny thing happened. You could look at their annual financial reports, the, the 10K documents that they have to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission, and see that suddenly Apple wasn't making all its money in the U.S. anymore. Uh, and, and, and it said it wasn't selling as much stuff in the U.S. anymore. And in basically one year, from 2009 to 2010, Apple's U.S. share of pre-tax income went from like two-thirds to under a half. And, you know, and, and this was happening despite the fact that they hadn't really, it's not like they built, built a factory uh, offshore or anything. They hadn't really changed their legitimate business practices at all. So that made a lot of people, uh, you know, prick up their ears a little bit and just say, well, what's going on? And that was actually, that shift was actually what prompted uh, both the EU and the U.S. Senate here in the States uh, to launch pretty detailed investigations into what Apple had done. Um, that was the first real indication that anybody had that Apple was maybe doing some things that weren't quite legal or you know we're, we're sort of on the on the verge of being illegal and uh, it took about three years after that but in 2013 the US Senate's uh, permanent com subcommittee on investigations uh, headed by Carl Levin put out a pretty scathing report detailing uh, the tax avoidance techniques that Apple had been using. The bottom line was that the reason we saw Apple's U.S. income share just draining away starting in 2010 was that they had set up these subsidiaries in Ireland. Subsidiaries with no employees, with no productive activities. Subsidiaries that didn't really do anything except, it turned out, to uh, act as a repository for the intangible income, the intellectual property of U.S. Apple. It was a sham. It was a purely an accounting maneuver, but it was an accounting maneuver that allowed Apple to take profits proper, uh, that were properly attributable to the U.S. and just move them to Ireland. And the reason that was helpful to them is that, um, it turns out, is that Apple had made a sweetheart deal with the government of Ireland to get an especially low tax rate. Uh, app apparently the 12.5% tax rate that was available to everybody in Ireland at the time was not good enough for them. Uh, so they sought out a special company-specific deal where they'd pay tax rates of 1% or even less. And so what the U.S. Senate committee figured out was that Apple had just been shifting astonishing amounts of money, uh, billions of dollars of profits, out of the U.S. and into Ireland in a completely insubstantial way and paying little or no tax on it instead of paying the 35% tax rate that uh, they should have been paying in the U.S. So that was the start of it. Um, after that, I think uh, the next thing people noticed was that Apple was doing the same sort of thing in the U.S. Um, and this is, you know, this is actually kind of common. Uh, Apple, as you know, is, is based in Cupertino, California. Uh, they've always said that most or all of their R&D, 
most or all of their intellectual capital is being built in Cupertino, where, where, their, where their headquarters is. But they started setting up subsidiaries in other states within the U.S. In particular, they set up a subsidiary in Nevada, uh, you know, not too far away, which has no uh, income tax to speak of. And so that was a way for them to avoid state income taxes as well. So now we knew that Apple was finding ways to uh, avoid paying U.S. taxes at the federal level and avoid paying state taxes as well. Um, the, I guess the, the, the next thing that uh, people started documenting, and, and my organization in particular uh, started paying attention to this, was the sheer quantity of profits that Apple is shifting offshore. Uh, there's, we, we can talk about this uh, at length, but there's, uh, there's not an awful lot that publicly traded companies like Apple have to disclose to their shareholders about their tax paying behavior, where they're earning their money, where they're paying tax, just very basic stuff like U.S. versus foreign income and tax. But there's one thing that Apple and companies like them had to disclose uh, for most of this past decade that was really helpful. And th what it was, was they had to say how much income they had stashed permanently offshore, you know, anywhere outside the U.S., and how much tax they'd pay if they brought it back. This was really helpful information because you can tell pretty much how little tax a company has paid by these disclosures. If they say they're going to pay 0% when they bring profits back, that meant they'd already basically paid 35% to a foreign country. If, on the other hand, they said they were going to pay 32%, which is what Apple said, that meant they were paying an average of about 3% to the foreign government uh, in the country in which these profits were allegedly being earned. So we knew from these disclosures that two things. One was that Apple was building up very rapidly these offshore profits that the U.S. government hadn't been able to tax. And the other thing was that they had been basically paying nothing in income taxes to the countries in which these profits were allegedly being earned. I don't think these companies are above the law, and I think we can get to a place where they are entirely subject to the law in exactly the same way that, uh, that we as individuals are. There's laws, they have to, have to obey them. Um, there's no question that we're in a place where companies like Apple have special access to Congress have special access to the process of changing laws. That doesn't make them above the law, but it does mean that they have the capacity to effectively change the laws in ways that they like. And that is profoundly disturbing. And it's the sort of thing that uh, is going to take some time and a whole lot of campaign finance reform, I guess, to change. Um, but, but no, they're not above the law. And the sheer amount of attention that has been paid by the EU, by the U.S. Senate's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations and other congressional committees, by NGOs like mine and, and, and many others over the past decade, I think has really resulted in us getting to a place where we know these companies aren't going to be above the law going forward. There's too much consciousness of what they've done and the likely illegality of, of, of a lot of it for them to just get away with this going forward. So I think that's the good news. That's the direction in which we're moving. So um, I, think there was, I think there was a time when these companies were basically above the law. It had to do with, uh, you know, the fact that they were sort of ahead of the curve on this move towards an intangible economy and then they got ahead of the laws. But I think we're past that now.